And uh, well, we are in the uh, study of Isaiah, and we are in the fourth session, and we are going to explore tonight chapters eight and nine, if you will. And uh, so, chapter eight is uh, we're going to discover in the first four verses that Isaiah's son is born, and he is named before he's born. By the way, very interesting subtlety I want you to pick up on. The next few verses will talk about the overthrow of Damascus and, and Samaria by Assyria. Both Damascus and Samaria were adverse to Judah, and uh, but Assyria is being raised that will actually deal with all of that. And then the chapter will close with uh, some admonitions about waiting on God and rejecting occultic wisdom. So there are aspects of this that are more than just uh, historic. They're admonitory for all of us, and we'll get into that, of course. But uh, what I'm going to do, I'm, I also realized in the previous sessions, we didn't do the I, ISV justice because we chopped it up so much. So I'm going to go the other way around. What we're going to do this time, we'll take the ISV as sort of a segment because it, you'll really get a better feeling of the flow of the text that way. And uh, 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 that's where it shines, if you will. Then we'll use the King James for the more detailed exposition. But we'll go to get the flavor of the thing first from the ISV. I think it'll be useful that way. So let's just start with the first four verses as it's seen through the ISV. The Lord also told me, take a large tablet and write on it with a stylus pen for Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Then I will call Uriah the priest and Jeberechah, son of Zechariah, as reliable witnesses to testify on my behalf. After this, notice that all occurs before the, before the birth here. After this, I was intimate with the prophetess and she conceived and later she bore a son. And then the Lord told me, call him Maher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the young man knows how to call out to his father and mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. So that's the flow of the thing. Uh, Judah is nervous because these two forces in the north, namely Samaria, the northern kingdom, and uh, Damascus, the Syrians, were allied against Judah. But God is going to use Assyria to set their clock, so to speak. That's the, fla the geopolitical flavor uh, that we'll just jump right into. Now, shifting back to verse 1 in the King James, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write on it with a men's pen concerning Mahel Shalal Hashbaz. And uh, that in the Hebrew is saying, In making speed to the spoil, he hasteth to the prey. And you say, that's kind of, Can you imagine going through school with that as a name? That's got to be tough. But that's what God told him to do. And he told him to do it even before the son was born. The way we might say it is haste makes waste, perhaps. See, Damascus was the Syrian capital, which had been at enmity with Judah. And it was confederate with Israel, or the northern kingdom, if you will. And, uh, they, but they're about to be spoiled by the Assyrians. And so at the same time, Israel was to fall a prey to this great and mighty power. Assyria is going to not only set the, take care of their enemies, God's going to also use, him, use them as this form of judgment. To, against Judah also, to, to an extent. And so this is all going to transpire before the child was fully grown, is the flavor. That's why his, the, the, his role here, strangely, is as a, as a sign, if you will. And so, and, th and this was recorded in the temple before he was born, interestingly enough. So, uh, and as I took, a, took unto me faithful witnesses uh, to record, Uriah the priest, Zechariah the son of Jebechariah, and uh, Uriah, by the way, is the high priest that was used by Ahaz later. We'll see that in 2 Kings 16. And Zechariah was the father of Ahaz's queen, by the way, small point. But uh, let's go on. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. And the Lord said unto me, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. I jumped to the private conclusion. He must have gotten a nickname. I can't imagine going through school with that, but we'll move on here. And before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father, my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. And so, uh, the, see, the enemy in the north is planning to come against Judah. They're going to be taken away into captivity by Assyria. So God's going to solve that problem in, in, in that way. And uh, the victory will be to this, uh, due to the sovereign grace of God. And God is making this very clear, not because Ahaz was so clever or anything. God is taking care of this horizon for them. And by the way, all this is confirmed in inscriptions they found by tiglath pileser the king of Assyria. So this is archaeological uh, confirmation. Well, let's move on to the next segment, 
which is where Assyria invades. In the ISV it says, the Lord spoke to me again, because his people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shaloah, and because they, they keep rejoicing in Rezin and Ramalia's son, watch out! The Lord God is about to bring the flood waters of the Euphrates River against them, mighty and strong. He's using that as an idiom, if you will, of Assyria. See? It's the king of Assyria and all of his arrogance. He will rise over all the river's channels and run over all of its banks. He will sweep on to, into Judah and overflowing as he passes through like flood waters reaching up to a person's neck. His outstretched wings will flow as wide as your, your land, O Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel refers to the land of Emmanuel, interestingly enough, but uh, that is what it is. The, the uh, reason I like this better, by the, the, you, you get a flip from the ISV, you at least get a flow. And you get, you get a little bit of a glimpse of the eloquence of uh, Isaiah's writing. In the King James, by the time you get that translation, you lose the flow of it, you will. At the same time, I still regard the ISV as our anchor point here for uh, exposition. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as the people refuseth the waters of Shaloah that go softly and rejoice with resident and Ramalia's son, it's going to go here in a minute. But see, the allied peoples of Syria and Samaria, and when I say Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom, it's, it's, so, uh, which calls themselves Israel. Uh, the, I like the term northern kingdom, so we don't get confused with the nation Israel, with the house of Israel. Many people do. And so they, re, anyway, the peoples of Syria and, and, and uh, Samaria, refuse to recognize the value of the association with Judah. So they spurned the waters of Shaloah, that is, the waters of peace. The Shalo, there's a, a, a play on words in here. And they joined forces under Rezin, the Syrian king, and Pekah, the son of Amalia, the upstart king of Israel, in order to destroy Judah, was their, was their idea. And uh, so, uh, we could go on more, but let's just go on here. Uh, Shaloah, see, means peace sent, if you will. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. So the Lord is bringing against them the armies of the king of Assyria, which would flow over the lands. You see, like a river is the idea, is the flavor. You, you get the, the eloquence of Isaiah here, not to confuse us though. And the river, that when he speaks of the river, the river, of course, is the Euphrates, and it's idiomatic, if you will, of the Assyrians. And he shall pass through Judah, and he shall overflow and go over, and he shall reach even to the neck, and the reaching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Band together, you peoples, and be shattered. Listen, all you distant countries. Strap on your armor, but be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will be all for nothing. Go ahead and talk, but it will all be for nothing, for God is with us. And so, uh, pretty straightforward. King James handles it this way, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. It repeats it that way in the Hebrew. Uh, take counsel together, and it shall come to, to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. So the King James is accurate, but it doesn't have quite the flow that we feel in, in, with the ISV. Uh, Show yourself. What is he saying? Make an uproar is the flavor, and that's what the ISV picks up on that. The ISV continues then, For this is what the Lord spoke to me. As his forceful hand was resting on me, as he was warning me not to live the way his, this people were living. Don't call conspiracy everything that this people calls conspiracy, and don't fear what they fear or live in terror. The conspiracy there, of course, is the conspiracy of the north against me. He's talking about the Lord of the heavenly army, uh, armies. He's the one you are to regard as holy. Let him be the one whom you fear, and let him be the one before whom you stand in terror. And so, uh, the, the, the ISV picks that flow. Let's go to the, the King James has it. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, um, and, and by the way, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the child, God with us was the child Emmanuel, and that child will be with the same stone and rock that will show up in verse 14 here in a minute. Say ye not a confederacy to them who, to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, let him be your dread. And you know, it's interesting to discover if you really study your Bible, confederacies with the world are never effective. That's part of the under, undercurrent here. And a good example of that is the letter to Pergamos in the seven letters of seven churches. Because what Satan couldn't, what couldn't achieve by persecution here, 
achieved by a, con a conspiracy or a marriage with the world. That's what Pergamus means, a mer perverted marriage, and when you study the seven letters. So those ideas uh, are here in Isaiah, but they also echo through the New Testament too. And so the idea here, the conspiracy he's talking about here is the, the, uh, the attempt to terrify Judah by a confederacy between Syria and the northern kingdom, uh, uh, the, uh, whose headquarters was Samaria. And so um, we covered all that back in chapter 7 too, I believe. But let's move on with the ISV. Then he will be a sanctuary, but for both houses of Israel, he'll also be the stone with which someone strikes himself, a rock which one stumbles over, a trap and a snare to those who live in Jerusalem. Many will stumble on them. They'll fall and be broken. They'll be snared and captured. And so this is where Jesus, or the Messiah, is called the stone of stumbling. And he appeared, of course, in human form to both houses of Israel, is the flavor here. And it was a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The, the nation stumbled over him as was broken and scattered as predicted in verse 15 here. And so uh, that's where we get these expressions. I see them familiar to you in the King James. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Those are two titles of Christ. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. To both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And that's echoed in Ezekiel 11 and Psalm 91 and so forth. It's interesting, if you want to study the rock or stone throughout the Bible, it's astonishing to realize how often that is an idiom of Jesus Christ. Paul even says so in 1 Corinthians 10.4. The rock that followed them in, 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 followed them in the wilderness was Christ. He's speaking metaphorically, of course. So he's the, Jesus is the rock of offense and the stone of stumbling. Many people today find that name offensive. The Democratic Party just had their big convention and they disassociated them officially with God in any way, which is a strange position to take politically. It really calls the, many of the pastors in America telling people who are Democrats to, they can't be Democrats and Christians at the same time anymore, not with those declarations they made recently. Astonishing things. And yet uh, clarifying, actually. Clarifying. So a rock of events and a stone of stumbling. Many people today still stumble over that name. And, uh, but moving on. And many, many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. You know, it's interesting. To those who are willing to be taught of God, the word becomes increasingly precious as the days grow darker. And we're facing a world with great turbulence throughout the world. The Middle East, of course. Europe in its way. And the U.S. is facing turbulence that they, more than they have any capacity to imagine is forthcoming. And in those days, the Word of God will become more precious as the days become darker. We need to recognize that and we need to really do our homework in that regard. And that's what Paul warned them in, 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 in one of the Ephesians in Acts 20. And uh, also in chapter 3, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, even following. And so, but King James continues, And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And the two children he's speaking of, he has his two children, and they both were given names by God as a sign. We're going to look at both of them before we're through here. So, for signs and wonders in Israel. Okay? And uh, now the, uh, the two sons of Isaiah, okay? The one name means hurry to plunder, quick to the loot. Strange name. And the other one we talked about, earlier, a remnant shall return. Okay? And uh, so the, these were signs of two things. The return of the, uh, at the end of the 70 years captivity. Judah is going to go into captivity for 70 years. Not wiped out like the northern kingdom was. But they're going to go into captivity for 70 years and they will return. And that's why a remnant shall return is so prophetic. That's, that, was the, that was the reason God had Isaiah name his son and stand with him in those times. But they are also signs of a larger and final fulfillment of the Lord's return. That's going to have a double uh, fulfillment. In fact, you're going to discover when you get to uh, Isaiah chapter 11... That, that second time is going to startle you as you realize the implications for, the, for us today. And we'll deal with that in the, in, in the next session. But let's go on here. Let's pick up the ISV as it continues. 
So when they advise you, ask the mediums your questions and quiz the spiritists who chirp and mutter, shouldn't the people instead be consulting their God and not the dead on behalf of those who are living for instruction and for testimony? Surely they are speaking like this because the truth hasn't dawned on them. So the re remainder of this, you know, it's, let me ask a question before we go any further. Uh, when people discover the bankruptcy of materialism, they chase materialism, everybody does for a while, and the, 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 the perceptive ones realize that's bankrupt. The answer is not materialism. Fair enough. Where do they turn next? They try materialism and it doesn't work. They get rich or whatever and it doesn't satisfy. Where do they turn next? To spiritism, to the occult. It's, ast it's astonishing to me to see people who reject Christ, to see the things they then take up. It's really astonishing, really astonishing. But uh, that's what we're going to get into. The remaining part of this chapter gives us a solemn warning against spiritualism and any form of necromancy, communication with the dead. The King James picks this up. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits. I love this. And unto wizards that peep and that mutter, <laughs> should, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead. So I admit the, the flow of the ISV is comfortable, especially for a, 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 the beginning reader probably, because the flow is really there. But in the King James, uh, it, has a, it has a majesty and a coloration that I, I, I enjoy. The, the familiar spirit, and wizards that peep and that mutter. <laughs> I love that. And uh, so that's in Isaiah 29 and Leviticus 19 and so on. And uh, Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, when they have to, had the civil war after Solomon died, he took the northern kingdom into just exactly that, idolatry and, and uh, all of that. And that's all in 2 Kings 17 and following. And then uh, King Manasseh, who's going to follow Ahaz. Uh, actually, no, he's going to follow Hezekiah. But my point is, uh, when he comes to power, uh, he's going to be bad news bad news. And of course we have this very peculiar event recorded in 1 Samuel 28 where Saul the king against his own commandments seeks the witch at Endor. And even the witch at Endor is startled because Samuel does show up. And that's a, there's a very very strange passage there and uh, that uh, is worth your study. It's very provocative but let's, that's, that's peripheral to our interest here. And going on to verse 20, to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them. Uh, fair enough, that's straightforward. You need to understand that all such attempts to contact the spirits of the dead are forbidden in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 18, Leviticus 20, you know, there's many, there are many books floating around, even in the Christian community, that border in this area, and they're dangerous. They cause a lot of confusion, at the minimum. And uh, be cautious, be cautious, because God is very clear on those issues. But going on to verse, let's see, let's see how the SV picks the rest in the next segment. They'll pass through the land while greatly distressed and hungry. When they are hungry, they'll become enraged and, when they, and, and uh, they'll curse their king and their God. They'll turn their faces upwards or they'll look toward the earth. But they'll see only distress and darkness, the gloom that comes from anguish, and then they will be thrown into total darkness. Pretty dark. This is, you also get a flavor as you go here that Isaiah is eloquent. Even in the translation you feel the flow and, the, and, the, and the, his grasp for words here. The King James picks this up, and they shall pass through it hardly bestead uh, and hungry, and they'll come to pass when they shall be hungry that they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look toward the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Pretty straightforward, doesn't the expositional comment. Let's move to the next chapter. Because the next chapter is not only more fun, it's probably one of the most fantastic chapters in the Bible. And for a number of reasons. Now I should explain to you, many Christians don't realize that Handel did not write Isaiah. It's the other way around. Okay, But we're going to see the indebtedness that Handel has here to Isaiah here. I'm being facetious. I hope you picked that up. Okay, all right. And uh, we're in the first seven verses here, in the first seven verses of chapter 9 of Isaiah, you're going to see the most comprehensive prophecy of the Messiah in the entire Old Testament. 
So you're going to discover, if you whether you realize it or not, there's going to be very familiar, very precious seven verses forthcoming. And we're also, when we get to verse 10, going to discover a verse that is astonishingly relevant to what's going on today. And we'll take those one things. In. Now you should get a little bit of a perspective here. Isaiah began to prophesy at the death of Uzziah, who reigned for 52 years and was a good king. The next king was Jotham, Uzziah's son, and who was also a good king. The next king was Ahaz, the grandson of Uzziah, and the son of Jotham, who was a bad king, and a phony besides that. And it was during the reign of Ahaz that Isaiah made these prophecies concerning the Messiah. So it was a dark period in the history of the nation in which Isaiah gives us a bright light that shines even here today. So we're going to see the promised deliverer in the first seven verses, the prince, the prince of peace and his kingdom, and we'll talk about the throne of David. And from verses 8 to 12, we'll see a rebuke to Jacob and Israel, and, and because they are defiant rather than repentant. And that has huge implications, not just for them back then, but to us today. So we want to pick up on that. And of course, at the end, then, there will there'll be a judgment for not repenting. That is timeless, not just for them. So let's jump into this. The ISV, ISV picks up the first few verses. But there will be no gloom for her who was in distress. Formerly, he brought contempt to the region of Zebulun and region of Naphtali. But in the future, he will have made glorious the way of the sea, the territory beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. Don't let that slip by without your awareness. It's predicting a Galilean ministry for the Messiah. And when you realize that this is an Isaiah, hundreds of years before the Gospel period, that's startling, you see. The people who walked in, gar in darkness have seen a great light. For those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has shined upon them. What are they talking about? The light of the world. None other than the Lord Jesus makes his presence in the region that's known as Zebulun and Naphtali. That's what it's saying here. Let's look at the King James in verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. See, this was the very region that the Assyrian armies brought darkness and death uh, and, and, they would, and they would be the first to rejoice in the light brought by the preaching of Christ. In other words, the, the, the darkest period of the Assyrian invasion will be the most joyous period uh, forthcoming after that. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. You see how it's turning from darkness into an upbeat tone here. And so, and when it says Zebulun, that's the region that Nazareth falls in, if you will. That's why he's called a Nazarene. There's a play on words there. It's a branch. He's the, he's the branch. And it's, it's obviously Galilee. And so, and uh, it, not only is that point made in Isaiah, Matthew quotes it in regards to what I'm just said. This, and re remember that Matthew is quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek translation here. Let's take a look at what Matthew says in chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Matthew says, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. So he's actually alluding this to, to Isaiah's passage here. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying. And uh, so this is, this, the, in other words, Matthew's pointing out this quote is the, 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 of this very passage is a prediction of the Galilean ministry. Here's where he quotes it from. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So we might miss that, but, we, but Matthew doesn't, and he calls it to our attention. You with me? That's what I'm trying to say here. Okay. So he's quoting, obviously, from, from uh, Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2. It's slightly different than the Hebrew, only because he's quoting from the Greek, from the Septuagint. And so, uh, and so uh, it's almost as if Isaiah could look down through the ages and see Jesus making known the wonders of God's redeeming love as the light of life. That's what Isaiah is putting together here, his perception. But then he passes over his rejection in long years that followed, during which the people themselves are rejected. 
So he's going, to sk he's going to skip over that here for some reasons we'll deal with later. Let's consider the ISV here. You have, you have increased the nation. You have increased its joy. You, they, they rejoice in your presence as they rejoice at the harvest, and they are glad when they are dividing the spoils of war. Now as to the yoke that has been his burden and the bar laid on his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken it as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping soldier in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be used for burning as fuel for the fire. You know, you get a feeling that Isaiah is pretty eloquent. He's, he's pretty articulate here. Let's take a look at the King James here. And uh, Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. Uh, they joy before thee according to the joy of the harvest, and men rejoice when they divide the spoil. The Hebrew here is a little tricky, not the least of which the word not is in the Hebrew. It, it, it's, there's a, some, there are some translational issues underlying all of this. And uh, so, and it's, it's increased, not, not increased. That's, 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 that's misleading. In the King James, if you don't know that, it, it's really confusing. And the joy of the harvest, what harvest is it? Is it the jo Feast of Tabernacles at Sukkot? Or is it the in-gathering at Shavuot? There's commentators that really wrestle with that one. Uh, but there is another thing that lurks here. It's the belief of a number of outstanding expositors, namely uh, Dr. F.C. Jennings, uh, J. Vernon McGee, and H.A. Ironside, that there's a hiatus or an interval between verses 2 and 3, that refer, where, where the first two verses refer to Christ's first coming, and verse 3 refers to his second coming, as we'll see there's some support for that. And why is there this hiatus there? Because in that interval, God is calling out the church. We studied that interval at great length when we studied Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, which lies between 25 and 27. And that in understanding that interval is, uh, is critical there. And we also discover that hiatus is implied 24 places in the text, strangely enough, in the biblical, biblical text. And so uh, it's in that interval that God is calling out the church, which was unknown to Isaiah. And that's all in Romans 16, verse 25 and 26. It comes up when Jesus, in, when you get to Isaiah 61, Jesus is going to read out of Isaiah when he opens his ministry, his mandate. But he stops at a comma. And that comma has lasted 2,000 years. So we're going to get into all that then. But I'm just highlighting it now. You're going to notice this hiatus starting to surface in the biblical text. And... Uh, so be, just be alert to it. And uh, we'll move on here. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Which, by the way, puzzles me. I can't find any commentators that really attack this adequately. You've got three things here. You've got a yoke, a staff, and a rod. Why? Is it just a metaphor? Maybe. Thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And the day of Midian, of course, there was a defeat and so on. A yoke, a staff, and a rod. Why are they three? And I'll let you wrestle with that yourself. Is it possible that it's alluding to the adversary and an allusion to what some people call the satanic trinity? Satan and his two cohorts. That's a, a fringe speculation, but I'll leave that alone. You can study the day of Midian in Judges 7 if you want to get into that. But it's dealing here with the oppressor or taskmaster. You're going to discover that Isaiah and Micah speak of the oppressor as the Assyrian. The first ruler of the world, Nimrod, was an Assyrian in a sense. And the Pharaoh of Egypt, amazingly enough, was not Egyptian. He's an Assyrian. And, and Isaiah will take up that when we get to chapter 50. And many people believe the final world leader, what we sometimes call the Antichrist, is an Assyrian. And we'll be exploring that as we go further into Isaiah and, and other passages. So just be sensitive to that now. And so uh, uh, it's on Isaiah 52.4 where he identifies the Pharaoh of Egypt as an Assyrian. The Pharaoh is a title. It doesn't mean he's Egyptian. Many of the Pharaohs were not Egyptian. Pharaoh Necho was an Ethiopian, not an Egyptian. And the, this, with all due respect to Cecil B. DeMille and his movie, The Ten Commandments, which they picked Ramesses, uh, there's, some, there's some dispute about that. That's neither, not our issue here. Let's move on. Verse 5. For every battle of the warriors was with confused noise, and the garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Okay, so we got here to verse 5 of chapter 9. And the fun just begins for me. The next two verses are the most complete prophecies of the Lord to be found in the Old Testament. That's quite a statement. I hope you challenge that. 
Check it out yourself. Let's take a look at this. We're going to Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. And uh, up to verse 4 and 5 applied to the destruction of the Assyrian army and all of that. And, uh, and that was... Uh, yet they also aren't limited to that. They also get a, they survey the conditions that prevail through the long centuries of the diaspora. And that's, uh, that's highlighted in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, some other passages. We won't derail ourselves chasing that down tonight. So we get to the ISV handles it this way. For, us, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. For the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the growth of his government and peace there shall be no end. He shall rule over his kingdom, sitting on the throne of David, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of the heavenly armies will accomplish this. The ISV likes to call it the Lord of the heavenly armies. I somehow like the Lord of hosts, but that's maybe I'm just old-fashioned. Uh, uh, somehow, anyway, we'll move on here. Okay, that was the ISV. Fair enough, you get a flow there. But let's look at the King James. I think that's the one that will be actually more familiar to most of us. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now the first thing I want to show you, notice there's the child is born and the son is given. This highlights an, 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 a, an, a hermeneutical issue I want to highlight to you. I've studied the Bible for 65 years and I've, I've also specialized my profession in the information sciences. And combining those two experiences, I've come to the conclusion there are no true synonyms. Two words can be synonymous in that they mean almost the same thing. But watch out for that word almost, because in many times in that overlap, there's a discovery to be made. And here's one of them. A child is born, and a son is given. They're not synonymous. The child is born is human. The son that is given is divine. Oh, yes, you see, the child is born, that was fulfilled in Bethlehem. That's why we know this verse so well, because it shows up on all our Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born. Aha! But Isaiah is telling you something else. Unto us a son is given. That's divine. When did that happen? Not in Bethlehem. That happened in Golgotha. Whew, boy, got bookends on the ministry there. And there's more to that. We could spend the whole hour on that to show you those bookends. When Rahab keeps the two spies, and, she, and she, there's a pun that the Holy Spirit inserts in that tale, and all it goes. But... For unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given. Bethlehem and Golgotha. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Really? And his name shall be called Wonderful. And many, many commentators feel that as one word, Wonderful Counselor. Other commentators, they, they say there's four titles here. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We'll look at each of those four titles, except I'm among those that have a slightly different view because I think the first one are actually two titles. And why do I say that? Because Jesus said so. And I'll show you where. And uh, the word wonderful was the very name he used with the parents of Samson. When you see this peculiar uh, visitation in Judges 13, they ask, what is your name? He says, wonderful. He, that's the word he, that's the name he uses in that encounter. That's in the text, okay? And it really fer, refers to the mystery of his sonship. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 deals with, I encourage you to chase each one of these things down. The mystery of his sonship. That's a big mystery. It starts in the first three verses of John's Gospel and goes on from there. The idea that he's wonderful in the sense that he goes beyond human com comprehension. He's so wonderful, that word really means... He's beyond our real understanding, is the point, you see. Only the Father knows the mystery of godliness, according to 1 Timothy 3.16. So he is wonderful beyond our comprehension, is the point. He's also a counselor. He, what, it, what I mean by that, he's the revealer of the Father's will, 1 John 1, 7. And it's implied in his very title, the title of Jesus Christ is the Word of God. John uses that all through his Gospel because I believe he wrote his gospel after the Patmos experience, where that clearly was one of his titles. As the eternal word, he's the revealer of the mind and heart of God. Come to the earth. 
So that's the ultimate counselor. Not only to show us the way to the Father, obviously, but also to empower us that we might walk in a manner well-pleasing to the one who has redeemed us. So indeed, he's our counselor from both points of view. Are we together? I see lots of nods here. Okay, we're tracking. We're tracking. Good. That makes me feel good. The next title is The Mighty God. You know, many people would attempt to tone this down a little bit in order to make him a little less than the words imply. No way. No way. We need to understand who Jesus of Nazareth really is. Still. Always has been. The Mighty God. And uh, that's one of the reasons I believe that the book of Ruth is a prerequisite to understanding the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and following. He, mighty God, he is so called in Romans 9, 5, and 1 John 5, 20, and other places. He is featured in John, the first three verses of John, obviously, and uh, also Colossians 1. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. And by him all things are held together. Consist in the King James, but obviously it means more than that. And uh, so, just as God, he is as truly God as he was man. He is truly God as much as he was man. First point, pretty obvious, plenty of verses on that. He was truly man as he was God. That's something we miss. Many of us sort of have this idea, well, he became a man for three and a half years and then went back, went back to heaven. No, 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 no. See, the first thing as we encounter the Bible, the first shock, the first astonishing thing is that God chose to enter his creation. To enter the creation as a human being. And to fulfill a destiny that we couldn't fulfill for ourselves. So we, as you try to grapple that, that's our first big apprehension to deal with. As we mature, and as we begin to understand the gigantic gulf that lies between the puny man and the majesty of God, the bigger shock that we need to adjust ourselves to is that as we sit here tonight, there is a man sitting on the throne room of the universe. And that's staggering to realize. And that's why the book of Ruth is so crucial. To the little four-chapter book in the Old Testament, understand what is a kinsman redeemer. Because when you get to Revelation chapter 5, and they saw the seven-sealed book in the hand, and who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? It took a man. He had to be a kinsman of Adam. We don't understand what's going on. John did. He sobbed convulsively until the elders said, wait, 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 wait. No. The line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals he says, I turned, I saw, not the, lion, not the lion, he says, I saw the lamb as it had been slain. Whew, really? No, we need to understand that, that he was our kinsman redeemer. And that, that idea was, was agreed to and planned before the world was created. Ephesians 1, 4 and elsewhere. And uh, the, um, anyway, he was a man as much as God. He could, have, he could not have made atonement for sin otherwise. There's no way he could take our sins on him unless he was a man. He had to be what he was in order to do what he did. He was our kinsman redeemer. And you need to understand what that means. And your best way to embrace that is to a careful study of the book of Ruth, a little four-chapter book, where Boaz adopts the role of the kinsman redeemer. And by that, Naomi gets the land back and he takes a Gentile bride, which is prohibited by the law, by the way. But he took a Gentile bride. He purchased her. And she becomes on the, on the, on the Messianic uh, uh, family tree, of course, and on it goes. And remember that when you celebrate Christmas and you celebrate the angels that meet the shepherds in the field. Because they're in the field that belong to Boaz and Ruth. So you can tie that together if you like. Anyway, moving on here. Another title that's confusing is the Everlasting Father, or be more precise, the Father of Eternity might be a better translation of that. And uh, that's, he's not to be confounded with the Father, as we think of him, though he and the Father are one. Uh, but he is the one in whom all ages meet, John 10.30 and in the, in the Hebrew, and there's plenty of verses on that. And of course, the last of the bunch, 
whether it's four or five, how, that, up to you, is, of course, the Prince of Peace. That's not foreign to us. Um, that's the way he was presented to the world, and that's the way he was heralded by the angels at his birth. The Prince of Peace. And because of his rejection by the nation Israel, there can be no lasting peace until he comes again. There can be no peace until the Prince of Peace returns. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. Then he will speak peace to all peoples according to Isaiah 32. We're going to get into those 18 verses when we get to chapter 32. But it's astonishing to realize how much of contemporary theology is rooted in Isaiah. The role of the Gentiles is all there, but not the church, strangely. Those aren't the same thing. We'll talk about that when we get there. In the meantime, having made peace by the blood of the cross, all who put their trust in Him have peace with God, and peace fills our hearts and lives because of Him. Any peace you have derives from Him. We need to understand that. And we could, we could spend a whole hour on the different kinds of peace, but we'll go on here. Verse 7, we haven't got to verse 7 yet, that's just verse 6. <laughs> of the increase of His government peace, there shall be no end. Really? Upon the throne of David? What on earth is that all about? That is uh, uh, strange. And upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Yes, exactly. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Now I want you to notice the strange phrase. Of the increase of his government peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it in justice, uh, in judgment and justice from henceforth the emperor. Upon the throne of David, that is a, where is that throne today? Did that throne exist during his ministry? No, Rome ran, ran things during the ministry, didn't they? From the time he was born until after his death, they, Rome was running things. Where's the, where's the throne of David in his day? Where was it? Is he going to sit on that throne? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you need to understand the Davidic covenant. You can check that out in 2 Samuel 7. I'll let you do that on your own. Because they, well, the people will say, a lot of the people in the church say, well, that's an Old Testament concept. Oh, really? It isn't, but let's go on and let's see what the New Testament has to say about it. It's, it is the key feature of the Annunciation in Luke 1. It's the key fi fa fact of Acts 1, the Ascension. And it is the pivotal event in the book of Acts called the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. Let's take a look at each one of these. Let's start with the Annunci Annunciation. In Luke chapter 1, Gabriel is visiting Mary and says to her, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yeshua, or in the Greek, Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him, what? What? The throne of his father David. That was a promise to Mary. Well, that's just a metaphor. I don't think so. I'll show you why. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Is he doing that yet? Not yet. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Wow. Boy, boy. Well, let's go to the next one. The Ascension. Actually, we get through the, the Gospels. We're in Acts chapter 1. And they're getting ready for the Ascension there. And the disciples are around there. And they said, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying... Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. You know, it's amazing to me to realize that uh, many people don't recognize that's a confirmation. He says the timing is none of your business, but what is the, the way he says it, though, implies he's going to do it, but it's his business when? which means he is yet going to restore again the kingdom to Israel. Wow, you know, with all the turmoil in the Middle East, people say, aren't you worried about Israel? No, I'm not, because I read ahead. He that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Israel isn't our problem. It's not the U.S.'s problem. <laughs> it may be Iran's problem, who knows, but the point is, no, it's God's burden, and he'll deal what he's going to deal, and we'll stand back and watch. I do worry not about Israel, but nations that don't support him. The security that America's had for centuries, well, not centuries, but a long time, is their, their, their support of Israel's right to exist. That's been a shield to an overdue judgment. And they have officially decided to go the other way. Oh, I tremble for America. 
But that's a whole other chapter, isn't it? It's not for you to know the times of season with the Father putting his own power. Right on. We'll, we'll watch from the sidelines here. Well, let's go ahead and look at the Council of Jerusalem. In Acts 15, there's a pivotal event of the book of Acts. And uh, which what uh, the, the Schofield Study Bible uh, calls the most important dispensational passage in the entire New Testament is the Council of Jerusalem, the one we're going to look at here. And what we need to understand, that council is uh, uh, compiled together to deal with two questions. The first question is obvious from the text, and that is they obviously are all upset about what does a Gentile have to do to become a Christian? Because Paul and Peter had experiences that they wanted to share with Jerusalem, and, they, and the traditional Jewish view was that the way you, became, got, you got right with God was to become Jewish, and then if you're a Jew, you accept the Messiah. That was their kind, even the, the believing Jew, that was his perception. And Paul and Peter says, no, 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 they, we, 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 how can we give the Gentiles a, cross, a burden that we can't even bear? So there's a big debate, is what does a Gentile have to do to become saved? That was the primary issue. And they deal with that head on. He does not have, he's not under the law, he doesn't have to, Shabbat and all that sort of thing is, is not his burden. And they, they made that quite clear. And that's obvious from the whole passage as you read it. What many people miss though, there's a, a lurking second question behind the scenes. If a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to become a Christian, what's to become of Israel? And J uh, James, who's chairing the thing, is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, quotes from Amos 9 to answer that. And let's take a look. So James speaking here in, in Acts 15, verse 15, And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, and he's quoting from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth all these things known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. I want you to notice this very very strange quote that he takes from Amos 9. God speaking through Amos says, after this I will return. I love that phrase. That occurs a couple of times in the Old Testament. It's always provocative that God is going to return. That means he must have left. After this I will return. In other words, he must have left at one time. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. Don't confuse that with the temple of Solomon. The temple of Solomon was a priestly structure. The tabernacle of David was a palace for the king. After this I'll return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. Wow! Is that really going to happen? Do you realize every time you pray the Lord's Prayer you pray for that? When you say thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. You're praying, many Christians you repeat that prayer with no grasp of what they're praying for. What, is it, what are they talking about? Isaiah 9 ended the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We're not dealing with metaphorical twists here. You can't spiritualize these things in a way into some kind of fuzzy, fuzzy thing. No. It's very specific what it's talking about and it underscores that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do that. And uh, it's really astonishing that uh, the throne of the Lord, the, the, the throne of David and for reasons I'll just tease you with a little bit, I believe that throne is on the planet Earth today. I think it's been under the custodianship of the Ethiopians. The mercy seat, not the Ark of the Covenant, that's falling apart. It's wood covered with gold and it's, 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 it's uh, suffering um, in, in its carrier there. But the top of it, what we think of as the lid, is a separate thing all, all through Scripture. It's called the mercy seat, hammered gold. And, uh, and the scripture, we're going to deal with this when we get to Isaiah 18. It may surprise you to discover that there's a trail of that in the scripture. We'll talk about that when we get there. And we'll talk, we'll talk about the discovery on Tanakirka's Island and, and some of those things and so forth. When you, pre when you uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know, that's an unfortunate label. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's the, not really the, the, the Lord's Prayer is in John 17, the Lord praying to his Father. What we have there, it's called the Lord's Prayer, should really be called the Disciples' Prayer. It's the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples to pray. Jesus could not pray that prayer because he didn't have any sins to confess, so forth. It was a prayer that he gave the disciples to use. 
it should be called the disciple. But we use the term Lord's Prayer, and that confuses people because the Lord's Prayer is in John 17 and worthy of a study. But the, the, the prayer that he gave his disciples has this p- passage we're all familiar with. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Do you realize there's nothing on the earth that is more certain than that? Nothing in heaven or earth is more certain than that. Thy kingdom come. It may shock you to hear this because in nine out of ten churches around the world, that's not taught. Because many churches have a perspective they call amillennialism. They think the millennium of Revelation 20 is just a metaphor. They overlook the fact that most of what we know about that comes from the Old Testament, not the New. Isaiah, we're going to deal with that when we get to Isaiah 65. And uh, thy kingdom come. There's a lesson we can get from our Chinese friends. They believe, they have what they call a kingdom perspective. They believe that they're in the kingdom of preparation, that the, what we call the name, they call the kingdom of inheritance. And they believe the responsibilities and authorities there will derive from their faithfulness here. They call that a kingdom perspective. And uh, in the U.S., that's a big controversy. Uh, I, won't, I won't start on that one here. The return of Christ to actually rule is almost, there's over 1,800 references in the Old Testament. There are 17 books that give prominence to that event. There are over 300 references in the New Testament. Over 200 chapters, 23 to 27 books give prominence to that event. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming, there's over 300 of those, and each one was fulfilled precisely, literally, accurately. Every prophecy of Christ's first coming, there are eight, seven or eight at least, of His second coming. And we're naive if we think they're going to be any less specifically, literally fulfilled than the first bunch were. And I, Hosea, the last verse in Hosea 5, is God again used this return phrase, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. That's, that is uh, singular and specific. The rejection of their Messiah. Until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. Interesting, that, that explains the whole purpose of what we call the Great Tribulation. I should say what Jesus labels as the Great Tribulation. Until they acknowledge their offense. Well, let's move on here, if you wrap this up here. A rebuke to Jacob and Israel it follows in the ISV. It says, the Lord sent a plague against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel. And all of the people were evil, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, saying loud, uh, proudly, with arrogant hearts. Notice that phrase. What they're about to say is arrogant, with, uh, with, with proud, proud and arrogant hearts. Verse 10 is an interesting verse. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamore trees have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Interesting thing. But I want you to notice how the prophet, he's shifting back to local conditions, and he's noticing the arrogant pride that he highlights here in verse 10. Let's see what the King James does with it. The Lord sent word unto Jacob and light upon Israel. And I want you to notice the contrary between Jacob and Israel. Jacob is in the flesh and Israel is the spirit, but we'll go on here. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, and shall say, in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stone, and sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. I want before we get into verse ten, that's going to be a critical verse, I want you to notice the tone with which Isaiah is presenting it. That they're saying this in pride and stoutness of heart. Okay? Many, many public people in recent years have quoted this verse from national platforms with total ignorance of its context. Because they don't realize by using it the way they're using it, they're falling into being arrogant and uh, unteachable. It's a verse of pride and it's void of repentance. Okay? The bricks are fallen down. That's bricks, in, uh, the bricks are falling, the bricks are expendable, they're sun-dried, hurt, they, they, they're, they're not, we're going to, the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. Say, we're going to do better. Those are just bricks, we're going to replace those with hewn stones. Oh, really? The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Sycamores were expendable, cedars were a symbol of, of they were cedars of Lebanon, big deal. So hewn stones rather than cheap sundown bricks. Cedars rather than expendable sycamores. That's what they're saying. Isaiah 9.10. It's an example of a popular verse that's totally misapplied in public over the, in the last uh, de- decade, many times. Many prominent people have quoted this verse in rebuilding the Twin Towers from the 9-11 disaster. And it's, it's uh, fascinating to watch this. 
they are indulging in precisely the very error of what this passage warns in the pride and stoutness of heart. Defiance rather than repentance. Defiance rather than repentance. They don't recognize the Twin Towers should be a call to repentance, not a mustering of pride that we're going to rebuild better than we did before. They miss the point entirely. Jonathan Kahn, a rabbi, has published a book, it's a bestseller lately, called The Harbinger. And he makes, he makes a whole career of this one verse, really. On September 11, 2001, the wall of protection was broken. America made a mistake in not searching its heart after this attack. There was no acknowledgement of a judgment from God. That's his argument. The nation rebuilds stronger than before, but without seeking God and without repenting. That's going to make it worse than before, is his argument. The leaders vow to rebuild an even bigger tower in a defiant spirit. And that's where we have the foundations and the huge freedom stone at ground zero. They actually found a fallen sycamore tree, symbolic of the uprooting, and the tree of hope they replace it with, a cedar by the way, is a sign of the nation's defiant rejection of God's call to return. That's his view. And he makes a good case. You can check that out. He's, it's a... It's a but let's get back to local tradition. But the Lord has raised adversaries from Rezin behind against him, and he stirs up his enemies, Arameans, those are Syrians in other words, from the east and Philistines from the west, and they devour Israel with open mouths. Yet for all this his anger is not turned away, and his hand is still stretched out ready to strike. And uh, that's a strange refrain we're going to deal with here in a minute. Let's do it from the King James. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him and has joined his enemies together, the Syrians before, the Philistines behind and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. That little frame, refrain that ends this ver uh, uh, verse 12 shows up five times in the, uh, in the text. And uh, three times in this chapter alone, strangely enough. What does it mean? What is that, what's going on there? That's going to be repeated three times in this chapter. Let's go look at the ISV. Let's see the flow here. But the people have not returned to rely on him who struck, who, who struck them, nor have they sought the Lord of the heavenly armies. So the Lord has cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch and reed in a single day. The elder and the dignity is at the head, and the prophet who teaches lies is the tail. For those who guide this people who have been leading them astray, for those who are guided by them are swallowed up. Continuing in verse 13 here in the King James, For the people turneth not to him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. And that's exactly what Ahab did. He went to the, led, uh, the worship of Baal. You see that in First Kings 16 and others. And Jehu's, uh, his reform was skin deep and so on. The palm branch and the rush and the mire and so forth. There's a contrast that uh, is made here and elsewhere. But moving on. The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches the lies, is, he is the tail. For the leaders of the people cause them to err, for they are led of them, they that are led of them are destroyed. So it's obviously false leadership, and that's hammered all the way through Isaiah. We'll run into that again and again later in his book. And these are idioms from Revelation, of course, you probably recognize. And Jeroboam turned to calf worship, you know all of that. And Ahab, of course, turned to Baal. So we'll be hearing more about that later in the book. Therefore the Lord does not have pity on their young men and has no compassion on their orphans or widows because each of them was godless and an evildoer and every mouth spake, uh, spoke folly. Yet for all this his anger is not turned away and his hand is still stretched out ready to strike. See there's that phrase again. For wickedness has burned like a blaze that consumes briars and thorns that sets thickets of the forest on fire and skyward they swirl a column of smoke. Boy he's eloquent. The King James uh, Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in the young men, neither shall they have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For every one is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And there again we have that strange free phrase, refrain closing out again. For wickedness burneth as the fire, and shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. I still like the King James, but I, I, I confess that I can see the flow of the King James, the uh, ISV is helpful. And uh, obviously this burning, uh, you know, Moses' burning bush was an idiom of grace because the bush was in fire but not consumed. So 
recognize that metaphor as two sides, if you will. Let's go back to the ISV. It says, For the wrath of God of the heavenly armies, the land has been scorched, and the people have become like fuel for the fire, and no one will spare his neighbor. They cut meat on the right, but they're still hungry, and they devour also on the left, but they're not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own children. Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Those are brothers, you see. Together they are against Judah. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is still stretched out. There's that refrain. It's almost like a chorus going in there. So through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened. The people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And of course, Pekah was the, incidentally the victim of Hosea. He was the ninth, and Hosea was the 19th, 19th uh, and last king of Israel. He succeeded Pe- uh, Pekah, who he, uh, he murdered and uh, so that he got his desserts, so to speak. And he shall snatch on the right hand, be hungry, and shall eat on the left hand. They shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. And Manasseh, Ephraim, Ephraim, and Manasseh, they shall together all be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. So the, the, obvious, the previous ones are the primary tribes in the northern kingdom. They were willing to unite against Judah. But for all this, God's anger is not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. So that, that uh, hand stretched out to, to smite, not to save, is the point. Three times in this chapter, and there's a couple of more places. In Isaiah 5, we saw it once, and we'll see it again in Isaiah 10. So it shows up five times. What's the context here? Since this context is not just local, this context echoes to this day. Since no repentance was forthcoming from the northern kingdom of Israel, the Lord's hand of judgment, what I'll call his abandonment wrath, will continue to be outstretched unrelentingly uh, and will result in their captivity. Will continue to be outstretched unrelentingly and will result in their captivity. And that's exactly what happens. And his abandonment wrath, that's worthy of study. Does the question that faces all of us is that, does that fit anyone you know? And I think it fits America. And you can come to those conclusions yourself. So for the next session, I encourage you to prepare by studying three chapters, 10, 11, and 12. One of them is very short. You'll find it very, very rewarding. There's going to be a shocking prophecy that comes out of that too. It's, that's what makes Isaiah so much fun. There's a lot of history and a lot of deep roots here on the one hand, and yet these echoes clearly, intentionally fit our day-to-day. And so that makes it very, very exciting. So with that... Let you and I bow for a word of prayer.